It's not often that I get excited about a fault, but this one was particularly interesting. This is a Dixel uh, XW70K refrigeration controller. It's like those little programmable, well, like these. These little programmable temperature displays you get that have ridiculously huge menus, except this one has the menu system from hell because it is designed for controlling it's multiple things in refrigeration. So it's got a deep menu with a, a remote programming console for that. However, this one, let me just put the lid out of the way. This one had a super interesting fault. So it just wasn't working at all. And when I opened it up, it was really obvious what the fault was. I changed this capacitor. This electrolytic capacitor had domed. You can see the bulging there. Uh, it's a GLAN capacitor, which doesn't really have much of a history, to be honest. Uh, and someone choosing what I would call an off-brand capacitor has basically condemned a good quality controller uh, to failure. But the interesting bit is that when I opened it up, this transistor here was getting really hot, and I mean over 100 degrees Celsius hot, which is rated up to 150 degrees Celsius, but that you don't really want to run them that hot. And I was thinking, why would failure of this capacitor, this power supply capacitor, affect that? Now, if we look at the power supply itself, we've got a traditional transformer, we've got a bridge rectifier down there, and then we've got the smoothing capacitor. And from there, we've got a 7805 regulator, provides 5 volts to the logic circuitry, but also the unregulated supply powers these big chunky relays uh, for switching high loads like heating and compressors and stuff like that and fans. And these other relays are for auxiliary loads like solenoid valves and uh, alarms and things like that. Uh, the unit is notable for having a interface, a two-wire interface, to a remote display, and that is the complexity of what happened here and why that transistor was getting really hot. So let's take a look at the relevant parts of the circuitry. For obvious reasons, I'm not going to reverse engineer the whole thing because it's a monster. Let's focus down onto this. Uh, to put things into perspective, that is the back of the circuit board, covered in tracks, and uh, the other side is absolutely plastered in options. So it's very hard tracing things from either side of this circuit board because uh, the the tracks literally just jump backwards and forwards all the time and go other under components. However, let's take a look at this, why it failed and what that knock-on effect was. So the incoming supply to this goes to the transformer and it does so via this little blue component down here. See the blue component? That is a PTC thermistor and it's designed that if the uh, transformer is overloaded or fails in some way, it will just basically break the circuit in a controlled manner, but it can recover afterwards. It can reset. I've used them uh, built into transformers in the past in my fairground controllers because it just protected against those little accidents that happens. When uh, people uh, drop a neutral or swap a neutral with a phase, that's probably what it's for. It's basically a self-resetting system that detects that high current and shuts the transformer down for protection. But the output of that is AC. Let me just draw AC. So here's the zero voltage line, and here is the AC sine wave, right? And it goes through this bridge rectifier, and when it goes through the bridge rectifier, it gets rectified into a series of positive going humps and then because there's a big capacitor after it, the reservoir capacitor it averages out round about there with what's called ripple on top now the ripple is an important bit because the ripple is the current that's flowing in and out of a capacitor you'll see they have a, a ripple current rating and normally capacitor is running at in this case the ripple frequency is just 100 or 120 hertz. It's basically the mains frequency times two, um, 50 or 60 hertz times two. And normally these capacitors last forever. I mean, it's not even near anything particularly hot. It's not like right up against a heat sink. I mean, this transformer will get warm. The regulator might get a bit warm. Really, it's not going to get that warm. It is, you know, it's fine. It's not really going to suffer a lot of heat. But what normally happens uh, in switchwood power supplies the ones that are operating at very high frequencies, these capacitors do get roasted because the ripple happens at tens of thousands of times a second and they burn out quite quickly. You know, those capacitors have to be special low resistance, low ESR, equivalent series resistance. Uh, otherwise, they'd, they'd fail really quickly. This one can be a standard capacitor. And I've got equipment from the 1980s arcade games with original electrolytic capacitors that are still fine because they are not stressed in equipment like that. So it's really odd this one has failed. I get the feeling, uh, 
all I could find out about Glan was that they were a, a company that originally specialised in photo flash capacitors, but decided to get into the other markets and offered a cheaper product. That's maybe what happened here. And it's obvious that their formula was not good, and uh, it's caused outgassing, and it's caused this basically build up of pressure, little bubbles inside in the uh, electrodes that has vented over time the electrolyte. These feel unusually light, as if there's nothing in them. When I stick them into a component tester, well, I can show you that right now. Let's bring in a little component tester. These component testers are great. These uh, little things are just like one of the best things ever for diagnosing components. But if I stick this faulty capacitor in, say between here and here, it doesn't really matter which pins I put it on, and then I press the button to wake it up, it's going to say, it thinks, it's, uh, it's thinking about it, it's thinking about it, it says, I think it's a diode with a value of zero nanofarad. It is misinterpreted it as a diode because it is so gone. And on the capacitance tester, it just came up vaguely as about eight microfarad. It's screwed. It, the electrolyte has dried out. But here's the interesting bit. You see, there's a current limited supply based around that BD442G transistor. And uh, it's got a, it's a PNP transistor. So it creates a current limited positive supply. And uh, what we have here is a Zener diode, which sets with a resistor that sets a voltage on the base of that transistor. And then it measures the voltage across this resistor, depending on the current. Uh, and about 140 milliamps, it gets close to the, uh, threshold that this transistor can turn on and uh, the transistor starts turning off. So basically speaking, if you were to shunt this out, it goes to 140 milliamps and then the resistor will just temporarily dissipate heat. That's what should have happened. The output of that then goes to what I think is a Zener diode. It's basically stuffed right in there, a little tiny diode and capacitor. Um, and that may just be to crop the peak voltage possibly. I was getting quite a high voltage in the output of this one. Uh, but then, most interestingly, is a transistor, because this goes to a remote display with uh, seven-segment LED displays and buttons on it for programming the modes. I've not got one of those displays. It would been quite useful to have one. But to be able to communicate just using two wires, it does a quite clever thing. It shunts the power rail. So there's this transistor here. It's that little tiny transistor there. And it basically shunts that current limited supply and uh, the remote display reads that as it, it it's maintains its power supply most of the time. But when it sees it glitching off, it's got a capacitor that holds a reservoir to keep it running. But it can read that data that's coming across the two wires. And likewise, when the unit wants to communicate back, it glitches its own power supply out. It shunts it out and that can be detected by the receive uh, circuitry going to the microcontroller. But what's happened here is because this capacitor had failed, the processor has failed to boot up. And by default, for some reason, this is uh, shunted. And it may be just to make sure that until the processor booted, the remote display is basically turned off decisively to give it a nice hard reset, perhaps, because that's when it will be powered. And because this has been glitching and this the processor is not booted and this transistor has been turned on continually, it means that this has been acting as a current regulator. Instead of just sh small pulses, it's been running continuously, regulating the short circuit current to about 140 milliamps, which is a lot because the uh, it pulls the voltage down, um, very ripply voltage, but the average would still be quite high. And uh, at 140 milliamps, that translates to a lot of heat because this does operate in what's called its linear region. It operates like a resistor. Right, okay. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show the repair. Now, I've already repaired a controller, but I'm going to turn the soldier iron on and I'm going to show the whole process again for the guys who want to be able to fix these themselves. So I'll turn the soldier iron now, on now and come back in a moment. One moment, please. The soldering iron is up to temperature. Let's begin the repair. Here's what you'll need. You'll need the replacement capacitor, 2200 microfarad, 25 volts. You will need some desoldering braid or a desoldering suction pump. Optionally, a pointy wooden cocktail stick. These are useful for clearing out the holes and double-sided boards. And some lead-based solder, the flux core. I do recommend lead-based above lead-free. 
Other things that will be useful would be this uh, flux pen, which is basically a paint pen, but when you pump it, it's got liquid flux inside, and it just basically helps clean uh, the contacts of the circuit board. Uh, that is optional, though. I'd like to thank Grant for sending this, by the way. Um, two screwdrivers, right? The first one is a flat blade. And we're going to use this to open this up. Can I just say that it says Dixel is the brand, and that just makes me think of the Austin Powers character, Dixie. Dixie Normas. Uh, to get the cover off, you just pop it under here, and there's two latches. And at the other side, you've got another couple of latches again that just pushing the screwdriver up will release those. Now we have two screws. I'll just put that cover out of the way. We have a screw here with a crosshead screw, and we've got another one here between the live and neutral incoming supply. Note that there's lots of holes for mountings, but they're not all used. Only two appear to be used, so we'll take that one out. Note the ones that the screw goes in, because there aren't even pillars for some of the others. And once the screws have been loosened, uh, there's a little clip at each corner. So you do it at one side, and then it should basically just lift up, and then pull out. And you can then tip it up and drop those screws out. Okay. Now, here are the solder connections. We're going to zoom down this. Here are the two solder connections that we're going to do. They're the ones where you can find out yourself as a precaution. At this point, it's really important to note. The electrolytic capacitors are polarised. They have this stripe down one side marked with the negative symbols. It's really important you put it in the right way around. If you put it in the wrong way around, it will literally go bang. It will pressurise and fail. Uh, quite scary. So the grey stripes go away from the transformer and to that end of the circuit board. So just think, here's the transformer, there's capacitor. The grey stripes go away from it. The negative. So you want to hold that. And I'd recommend initially just touching a tiny bit of fresh solder onto these solder pads. So get your solder iron with a nice, fresh, clean, shiny tip. And uh, flow a little bit of solder on, then holding it at the back between a couple of fingers and supporting the circuit board, just apply very gentle downward pressure. Do not force it. Uh, just alternate between the solder pads like this, and each time you do it, you can rock the capacitor very slightly, but don't drag it out. Don't use force, because if you do, it can damage the tracks. So you want to just keep alternating and rocking the capacitor very gently as you release those solder pads. And at some point, it will just pop right out. It has just popped out. Then, the flux or the suction pump is to basically the desoldering wick is to mop uh, all the excess solder off that. And you want to mop it to the point that hopefully that hole will clear. If the hole doesn't clear, they've cleared in this instance, but if they don't, take a wooden toothpick, heat the pad up, and then just stuff the wooden pick, toothpick down into the hole. And because the solder doesn't stick to the wood, when you take it back out, it will leave the hole clear. That's a useful tip in general for uh, repairing circuit boards. Is this bright enough? I think it's bright enough. Now get your new capacitor, and observing the polarity, the long lead, the positive, is going towards the transformer. The stripes are going away from the transformer. Pop it into the position, and turn it over and hold it in, or use something to hold it in. Just whatever suits you. Ideally, it wouldn't be mounted hard against the circuit board. That would be quite useful mounting it off the circuit board a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. This gives it a little bit more rigidity for travel. Um, so now we're going to heat the pad and the lead, and we're just going to bring up to temperature and then touch a bit of solder iron onto, solder onto the solder iron, and it will then flow to actually make that solder joint. Check the capacitor is roughly straight-ish. Don't force it if it isn't straight. Don't... Uh, force it against the leads because that actually puts a lot of stress on the leads themselves and can damage the capacitor and then get the other one preheat it with the solder iron quickly and then just basically a little bit more solder onto that one the repair is done very straightforward it's up to you if you want to leave the flux on or try and clean it off i just leave it on it doesn't really matter uh, standard electronic grade flux does not cause corrosion uh, don't use pipe joining flux because that does cause corrosion and would indeed cleaned off don't use it in the first place to be honest okay now 
I'll just put this onto the tree and I'll plug it in and prove that it's working. So note that we've got the pillars here, but not at that side. So this screw here is going to that pillar there. So we sit it on, on at an angle underneath those clips at that side and then gently ease these ones back to let it just drop down into position. And I shall now get the cables. So this one is the neutral. This one is the live. And I'll bring up the happy as a means of quick connection of these wires. And I shall connect it up. And what we should hear is that if it's working now, we should hear the relays clicking on and off. So I power it up, there's a delay. The thing is booting up. The first relay has come in, and then after a while, other relays will come in. Probably to indicate there's a problem, there's the other relays clicked in. And the, that's probably to indicate the fact that it's not got its temperature sensors, so it's gone into some alarm mode. And that is the repair, complete. Um, although that transistor had got hot, I don't think it's been damaged, which is good. Um, but uh, I'll, the person who sent this in, I'll send them a wee message about this, about tests to. I would say that, uh, basically speaking, get a good working one and measure the voltage between these two pins here, the ones that are going out to the keyboard, and just make sure that it's somewhere, whatever voltage it is, that the repaired unit is something similar. But it should basically be the open circuit on the smooth voltage. But that's it. Right, one moment please, I'm just going to clear this off the bench. So the final bit of this repair is just as before, put it back, put that screw in the middle. Just to secure the circuit board down. Don't know if it's really actually needed, because those clips do quite well at the side. But I'd recommend doing it anyway. Sometimes these connectors are quite tight. Good choice of connector. Uh, one interesting note about this design is that they, the connections for the edge connectors, the, these plug connectors, they put multiple positions so they could move them backwards or forwards for fine tuning. I thought that was quite a nice feature. And then after that, uh, make sure that the label here, uh, where it says hotkey TTL, is uh, over to this connector here. Just line them up. Check everything looks all right. Press it down. This is where there's a real loud click, isn't there? Yeah, there's a real loud click. Uh, and that's your controller hopefully fixed. Um, so that's a good result. It just uh, it shows how somebody just cheaping out, getting these capacitors, these GLAN capacitors, it's not a good economy to do that. Uh, it's always good to go with a, a prominent brand. I'd choose something like perhaps Panasonic or something like that uh, just to get a known lifespan out of something like this, particularly on such an expensive product, because those relays and these connectors and the transformer, they're all expensive products, uh, the components, and uh, to just basically hobble that with a cheap capacitor just seems a shame. But there we go. That's it fixed, which is always a good result.